Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. The focus in this video is on two infinite sums. This is the first one, summation n from 0 to infinity of the tri logarithm evaluated at minus e to the minus pi times 2n plus 1, where n is the index of summation. The tri logarithm of z is given by the infinite series summation k from 1 to infinity, z to the power k divided by k cubed. This is for a complex z such that the magnitude of z is less than 1. We have another infinite sum, n from minus infinity to infinity. The sum is parameterized by two parameters, b, which we see here in the denominator, and b is a non-zero real number. And then there is eta between zero and pi, and we have it here in the numerator, which has cosine n eta. We will evaluate this summation first. This summation will provide us with a result that can be used in evaluating this other sum. To evaluate this series, we make use of the Poisson summation formula. We have two parameters, delta, which is a strictly positive real number, and omega, which is real. We have two sums that are equal to one another. On the left, we have summation k from minus infinity to infinity, g of k delta. If we define g as a function from r to c, g of alpha, where alpha is in r, is evaluated at k delta. We are evaluating function small g at all the integer multiples of big delta. And then we have this factor here, e to the minus i, 2 pi omega k delta. On the other side, we have the amplitude scaling factor, 1 over delta, and then summation n from minus infinity to infinity, all shifted copies of g of omega. So we have the copies of g of omega shifted to all the integer multiples of 1 over delta. Big G of omega is the continuous time Fourier transform of G of alpha. So these two functions, they are a Fourier transform pair. Because the Fourier transform can be defined in a number of ways, here we use this definition for the Fourier transform. G of omega is the CTFT of G of alpha given by the integral from minus infinity to infinity G of alpha e to the minus i 2 pi omega alpha G alpha. Consider the function g bar of alpha, which is given by e to the minus 2 pi, the absolute value of b, and then the absolute value of alpha. And b is the b that we have here in our sum of interest. Of course, the question that comes to mind is, why are we interested in this specific function? The reason is that, let's say, from the tables of the Fourier transform, we know that the Fourier transform of this function will give us something that looks like what we have here in the sum of interest. To obtain the Fourier transform of g bar of alpha, we take it, we multiply by e to the minus i 2 pi omega alpha, and then we integrate with respect to alpha. We have here the absolute value of alpha, so we split the integral into one from minus infinity to zero and another from zero to infinity. This integral gives us one over minus i 2 pi omega plus 2 pi times the absolute value of b, and this other integral gives us minus one over minus i 2 pi omega minus 2 pi absolute value of b, which can be written in this way. We can take 1 over 2 pi as a common factor, then combine these two fractions. We get the absolute value of b divided by pi, and then we have omega squared plus b squared. Note that if we replace omega by n, we get the denominator that we have in the sum of interest. But how do we obtain the cosine? Note that cosine n eta is 1 half e to the i n eta plus 1 half e to the minus i n eta. To get these exponentials, after doing the continuous time Fourier transform, we need a shift. To be specific, Consider the continuous time Fourier transform of g bar of alpha minus alpha zero, where alpha zero is some real constant. So that's a shifted g bar of alpha. If we multiply the function here by e to the minus i to pi omega alpha and integrate with respect to alpha, we can do a change of variables, u equal to alpha minus alpha zero. The integrand becomes g bar of u e to the minus i two pi omega, and then this alpha is replaced by u plus alpha zero. This exponential can be split into e to the minus i two pi omega u, times e to the minus i 2 pi omega alpha 0. This term does not depend on the dummy variable of integration u, so it can be taken outside the integral. And then the remaining integral is just the CTFT of the function g bar of alpha, which is big G bar of omega. A shift implies that the continuous time Fourier transform gets multiplied by this exponential vector e to the minus i 2 pi omega, and then the shift alpha 0. Thus, our function g of alpha, which we will use in the Poisson summation formula, is g bar of alpha, which is e to the minus 2 pi, the absolute value of b, the absolute value of alpha, but we will have two versions. One of them is shifted by eta over 2 pi, and the other is shifted by minus eta over 2 pi. Using the linearity of the continuous time Fourier transform and the shift rule, the Fourier transform of g of alpha, which is big G of omega, is g bar of omega, but because of this shift, it will be multiplied by e to the minus i 2 pi omega, then eta over 2 pi, plus e to the minus i 2 pi omega minus eta over 2 pi. This here is e to the minus i omega eta, and this one is e to the i omega eta. When these guys are summed together, we get 2 times cosine omega eta. This is big G of omega. Now we use small g and big G in the Poisson summation formula. We set big delta equal to 1 and omega equal to 0. 
if we use these, then we have summation k from minus infinity to infinity small g of k. And on the right hand side, we have summation n from minus infinity to infinity big G of n. Here is small g of alpha after replacing alpha by k. And here is big G of omega after replacing omega by n. On the right hand side of the Poisson summation formula, we have the sum of interest multiplied by 2 the absolute value of b over pi. So the sum of interest is equal to pi over 2 times the absolute value of b, and then this infinite sum here. We have expressed an infinite sum in terms of another infinite sum. So where is the benefit? The benefit is that this summation is easy to evaluate. We can write down the summation, as we will see, as a geometric series, which can be obtained in a closed form. So the idea of the Poisson summation formula is that, yes, we have two infinite sums on both sides, but it may happen, and this is our case here, that one of the infinite sums is manageable. We need now to evaluate this sum. We have an absolute value here of 2 by k minus eta. So this is equal to 2 by k minus eta if 2 by k minus eta is greater than 0. And this absolute value is equal to minus 2 by k plus eta if 2 by k minus eta is less than or equal to 0. 2 by k minus eta greater than 0 implies that k is strictly greater than eta over 2 pi. Recall that eta is greater than or equal to 0, less than or equal to pi. This condition means that k is greater than or equal to 1. We have another absolute value here. So this is equal to 2 by k plus eta if 2 by k plus eta is greater than or equal to 0, minus 2 by k minus eta if 2 by k plus eta is less than 0. This condition implies that k is greater than or equal to minus eta over 2 pi. So here, if eta is pi, then this is minus 1 half. If eta is 0, then this is equal to 0. So this condition here is equivalent to k greater than or equal to 0. What we will do is that for this term, we split the sum into two sums, one from minus infinity to 0, one from 1 to infinity. And this summation here from minus infinity to 0, we take this guy with a minus sign. So we put here eta minus 2 by k. When k is from 1 to infinity, we put 2 by k minus eta. Then to sum this term, again, we have two sums, one from minus infinity to minus 1. And in this summation here, we put minus 2 by k minus eta. Or we can put 2 by k plus eta and then eliminate the negative sign here. And then the fourth sum is a summation k from 0 to infinity of what we have here. We can replace k by, say, minus m in this summation and by minus v in this summation so that we have all our sums with non-negative or positive summation indices. That's it. Now, from this summation here, we can take e to the minus the absolute value of b times eta as a common factor. Then we have a geometric series. We have e to the minus the absolute value of b times 2 pi, all raised to the power m. And the summation here starts from 0. So this summation is 1 over 1 minus the ratio of the geometric series, which is e to the minus 2 pi, the absolute value of b. Here we have e to the power eta times the absolute value of b. This term does not depend on the summation index k. It can be taken outside. Then we have a geometric series, e to the minus 2 pi, the absolute value of b, or raised to the power k, because k starts from 1. Our result is the ratio of the geometric series, e to the minus 2 pi, the absolute value of b, divided by 1 minus the ratio. Similarly, we can evaluate this summation and that summation. Note that all the denominators are exactly the same. These four results can be combined. In the denominator, we have 1 minus e to the power minus 2 pi, the absolute value of b. And then in the numerator, we actually have this term appearing twice and these two guys appearing twice. So we can multiply by 2 or eliminate this 2 in the denominator. And what we have in the numerator is e to the minus eta, the absolute value of b, plus e to the absolute value of b times eta minus 2 pi. Multiply the numerator and denominator by e to the minus pi times the absolute value of b. If we do this, the denominator is e to the pi, the absolute value of b, minus e to the minus pi, the absolute value of b. And this is exactly 2 shine pi, the absolute value of b. When we do this multiplication in the numerator, we will get e. And then here we have the absolute value of b times by minus eta. The other exponent is exactly this, but with a minus sign. So what we have here is double the cosine of the absolute value of b times pi minus eta. We can actually remove the absolute values because the cosine function is an even function and x shine x is also an even function. This is the result that we have. For a non-zero real b and eta from 0 to pi, summation n from minus infinity to infinity, cosine eta n divided by n squared plus b squared, this is given by pi. And then in the numerator, we have cosine b times pi minus eta. And in the denominator, we have b times shine b by. And of course, 1 over shine can be written as cosine. Let's investigate two special cases. If eta is equal to 0, cosine eta n is equal to 1. And we have summation n from minus infinity to infinity, 1 over n squared plus b squared. This is equal to pi, then eta is equal to 0. This will be cosine b pi over shine b pi. So our result will be pi over b cotange pi b. If eta is equal to pi, cosine pi n is minus 1 to the power n, 
in the denominator we have n squared plus p squared. If eta is pi, we have cosine zero, which is equal to one. Thus, our result is pi over p shine pi b. Sometimes we are interested in the sum from one to infinity rather than from minus infinity to infinity. Note that the summand is an even sequence. So this summation can be written as the term when small n is equal to zero. When small n is equal to zero, we have one upstairs and downstairs we have b squared. So we get one over b squared. Then we have double the sum of cosine eta n over n squared plus b squared, but now small n is from one to infinity. To write down the sum, just move one over b squared to the other side and then divide both sides by two. If eta is equal to pi, this cosine is equal to one, we have pi over two b and then one over shine pi p minus one over two b squared. This summation becomes some small n from one to infinity minus one to the n over n squared plus p squared. If we move this minus one over two b squared to the right hand side and then multiply both sides by two b over pi, we get this useful result. One over shine pi b is equal to one over pi b plus two b over pi summation n from one to infinity minus one to the n divided by n squared plus p squared. Let's now move to our second sum of interest involving the trilogarithm. We have the sum over non-negative integer n of the trilogarithm of minus e to the minus pi to n plus one. The magnitude of the argument of the trilogarithm is strictly less than one. We can employ the series expansion. The trilogarithm of z is summation k from one to infinity z to the power k divided by k cubed. In other words, we convert the single sum into a double sum. We have the original summation here, and we have the series representation of the trilogarithm. If we have a look at the summand, it depends on the two indices n and k. The dependence on the index n is interesting. We just have e to the minus two pi k all raised to the power n. The sum of this quantity is a geometric series. We can evaluate the sum with respect to n. But the summation with respect to n is the outer sum. Are we justified in swabbing the order of summation so that we can carry out the sum with respect to n first? Let's recall Fubini's theorem. So if we have two infinite sums over indices, let's say n and k, like in our case here, and we have a sum, let's call it g of n and k. Is this double sum equal to the sum of g of n and k? But we do the sum with respect to n first, then with respect to k. Do we have equality here? Fubini's theorem provides a sufficient condition that validates the interchange of the order of summation and it tells us that we need to check the double sum of the magnitude of g of n and k the magnitude is real valued and non-negative to nil's result is that this double sum is equal to that double sum if one side is finite the other is finite and is equal to the exact same value if one side is plus infinity the other is plus infinity so if we go back to our sums here which do not have the magnitude for Beam's test is that we will investigate the double sum applied to the magnitude of the sum. If we get something that is finite, then we are justified in doing the double sum in any order of our choice. What I have just said is applicable to interchanging the order of integration or interchanging the order of integration and an infinite sum or interchanging the order of integration and an expectation and so forth. Let's go back to our problem and investigate the double sum applied to the magnitude. The magnitude of minus one to the k is one. This is a real value positive number. So its magnitude is itself. And then we have also a real positive number in the denominator, which is k cubed. But many, we can do this double sum in any way of our choice. If we do the summation with respect to n first, and as I said, we have a geometric series. So the summation with respect to n yields one over one minus the ratio of the geometric series. Then we have e to the minus pi k over k cubed and the sum with respect to k. Let's multiply the numerator and denominator by e to the pi k. Then we get summation over positive integer k of 1 over k cubed. In the numerator, we have 1. In the denominator, we have e to the pi k minus e to the minus pi k. This is 2 shine pi k. The shine function looks like this. The smallest value of k is 1. So we are interested in this part of the function defined from 1 to infinity. And the reciprocal, because we have 1 over shine, will be something that looks like this. In other words, 1 over shine by k is upper bounded by 1 over shine by times 1. This double sum here is upper bounded by 1 over 2 shine pi summation k from 1 to infinity, 1 over k cubed. This is a convergent series. This is zeta of 3 
which is a finite number, multiplied by another finite number, this double sum is finite. By Fubini, we can go back to our original sum, which does not have a magnitude, and we can do the summation in any order of our choice. And of course, we will do the summation with respect to n first, because it's an easy sum. It is the geometric series. As we did in Fubini's test, we will also multiply the numerator and denominator by e to the pi k, so that our result is one half summation k from one to infinity minus one to the power k over k cubed. And then we have one over shine by k. Recall from the previous page that this has the series representation one over pi k plus two k over pi summation m from one to infinity minus one to the m over m squared plus k squared. We can split this into a single sum and a double sum. To obtain our sum of interest, we will need to evaluate these two sums. What is the summation? Minus 1 over 1 to the power 4 plus 1 over 2 to the power 4 minus 1 over 3 to the power 4 plus 1 over 4 to the power 4 minus 1 over 5 to the power 4 and so on. We can split the sum into the even terms and the odd terms. The even terms will give us 1 over 16 times summation k from 1 to infinity 1 over k to the power 4. That's zeta of 4. Here we take it for granted that zeta of 4 is pi to the power 4 divided by 90. The summation here is 1 over 16 times zeta of 4. What about the sum of the odd terms? Well, the odd terms are zeta of 4 itself minus the sum of the even terms, which is 1 over 16 zeta of 4. All in all, we have 1 over 16 minus between brackets 1 minus 1 over 16 zeta of 4. This is 1 eighth minus 1. Thus, this summation here is minus 7 over 8 times zeta of 4. If we divide by 2 pi and use the value of zeta of 4, we obtain the value of this quantity here as minus 7 over 1440 times by cubed. To finish the problem off, we will need to evaluate this double sum. Here it is. Let's rewrite the double sum after renaming the index k as m and m as k. So we go here, replace every k by m and every m by k. Definitely, this will not change the value of the sum. This is what we get here. Can we rewrite this summation such that the inner sum is with respect to m and the outer sum is with respect to k? In other words, can we interchange the order? Let's try to apply Fubini's theorem again. We investigate the double sum applied to the magnitude of the sum. So this is the double sum of 1 over m squared, 1 over k squared plus m squared. 1 over k squared plus m squared is upper bounded by 1 over k squared. After doing this upper bounding step, now we have a double sum that can be separated into the product of two single sums, a sum with respect to m of 1 over m squared times a sum with respect to k of 1 over k squared. Each one of these sums is zeta of 2, which is a finite number. When we apply the double sum to the magnitude of the sum, we get a finite quantity. By Fubini, we are justified in interchanging the order of summation. The result that we get is that this summation here is exactly equal to that sum. The trick is that we will take this summation and write it as 1 half times itself plus one half times this other form. So we get a two here, and then we will have minus one to the power k plus m, which is here and there. We also have m squared plus k squared. But from this form, we have one over k squared, and from that one, we have one over m squared. Why do we do this? If we combine these two terms, we get k squared n squared in the denominator. In the numerator, we get m squared plus k squared. This goes away with that and now we have a double sum that can be separated into the product of two single sums like above we have minus one over one square plus one over two square minus one over three square plus one over four square minus one over five squared and so forth we can split this into the even terms those are one fourth of zeta of two minus the odd terms the odd terms are zeta of two itself minus the even terms all in all, we have 1 over 4 minus between brackets 1 minus 1 over 4 times zeta of 2. So this is minus zeta of 2 divided by 2. Zeta of 2 is pi squared over 6. So this bracket here or that bracket is equal to minus pi squared over 12. Thus, this is equal to 1 over 2 pi times pi to the power 4 divided by 144. Our sum of interest is minus 7 over 1440 times pi cubed. Then we have pi cubed over 288. Combining these two terms, 
we get that the sum of interest is minus y cubed divided by 720. 